Uh, last evening, we reported to you the preliminary findings from the from the audition of the cockpit voice recorder. And this afternoon, we will give you a preliminary rundown of the flight data recorder information. Uh, just as reported, uh, as we reported last evening, uh, as the aircraft was climbing through about 32,500 feet, the engine parameters, the RPM, two, both RPM indicators on, on the left engine went down to zero, oil pressure went to zero, and the engine vibration, which is measured, there's a, an indication in the cockpit for engine vibration, it increased significantly on the left engine. Shortly thereafter, the cabin altitude warning horn activated, and from my experience of flying the 737, I can tell you that that, that warning activates around 13,500, 14,000 feet, somewhere in there. So shortly after the engine indications went down and the vibration increased, that's when the cabin altitude warning horn um, started uh, making noise. Uh, indicating that the cabin altitude was going through 13,000, through, through about 14,000 feet. The aircraft began a rapid, uncommanded left roll of about 41 degrees of bank angle. So usually when you're flying on an airliner, you'd rarely get over about 20, 25 degrees of bank. This went over to 41 degrees. The pilots uh, leveled the wings and throughout the rest of the flight there was what I'm going to describe as a, a fair amount of vibration throughout the airframe, the airplane. As I mentioned last evening, the flight crew elected to land with flaps 5 as opposed to the normal setting of flaps 30 or flaps 40. They did that because they were concerned of aircraft controllability issues. And because they're landing with, with lesser flaps, that will mean a higher approach speed. The speed at touchdown was around, was right at about 165 knots. And that converts to 190 miles per hour. Now, to put that in perspective, again, I'm just going back to my days of flying 737s. So the speed at, at touchdown varies according to the weight of the aircraft. But to put it in perspective, I'm going to say that a, a typical approach speed for a 737 might be around 135 knots. This aircraft was landing at 165 knots. Again, the higher speed is because they landed with a lesser flap setting than typical. The time from the initial event to touchdown, 22 minutes. We have a very talented uh, meteorologist in Washington working for the NTSB as, as well as air traffic control specialist and they noticed on the air traffic control on the ATC radar indications they could see debris, reflections of debris being painted on the radar, indicating that there was debris falling through the atmosphere. And so they plugged in the winds and, and estimated where they thought this debris would land. And sure enough, the, the debris landed in about the area that they anticipated it would be, as we are finding. Yesterday, we reported that an engine cowling had been located about 65 miles northwest of, of Philadelphia. And in fact, we are finding, residents are finding additional uh, pieces of engine cowlings. Of course, p people have asked me this morning, what is the engine cowling? It's just the, the exterior part of the engine that keeps all the wires and pipes from being exposed, and so it's that's what that is, it's the outside of the engine, and that's the part that would be painted in the aircraft colors, the southwest colors. So we are finding additional pieces like that, and we're finding it because people are reporting it to us through our witness line, our witness email, which I'll give you in just a minute. 
and they're also notifying the local law enforcement uh, officials that they found found components. Keith Holloway, our public affairs officer, will tweet. He said he would tweet it as soon as I started started speaking. He will tweet uh, a picture of one of these components that was uh, was located yesterday. Our operations group, uh, they have requested uh, all FAA records related to this flight crew as well as company training records. And that's standard for any investigation like this. The pilot interviews are being conducted as we speak. And if questioned, I'd be glad to talk about how we go about with the pilot interviews. Uh, the cockpit voice recorder group. Uh, it will convene in Washington in the next few days. So typically what we do is we take representatives, we take an NTSB investigator who's a specialist in cockpit voice recorder readouts. We have a representative from the FAA, somebody from the aircraft manufacturer, somebody from the airline, somebody from the pilot's union, and they all listen to the cockpit voice recorder. And as they do it, they listen and say, what were they saying? And it's done the old-fashioned way. They listen and type out what they hear. And somebody says, I didn't hear what he said. So they back the tape up the old-fashioned way and play it again. And then everybody agrees on it, and they create a transcript. That transcript will be the official record of the cockpit voice recorder. So that becomes a public uh, document. The, um, and it's a time-consuming process um, because of the, uh, some factors, uh, one, of, one of which is the, uh, the, air, the sound of the uh, pilots using oxygen mask during the descent. Um, the, the audio is not as good as when they're using just their normal boom mics. So it will take some work, uh, several days, to recreate this, uh, this transcript or to create this transcript. Our structures group is documenting all damage to the aircraft structure. The, the leading edge of the left wing uh, suffered damage. It's banged up pretty good, and we can see paint transfer. We can see some blue paint transfer. We can see a little bit of red paint transfer. And sure enough, on the cowling, there is a red line that says hoist here for maintenance to know where the hoist hoist the engine so we can even see some red transfer from, of paint. So we know that that's some of that cowling coming off striking that leading edge of that wing. We've also been documenting the window frame area to understand the window frame that was blown out. Uh, the fatally injured passenger was seated in row 14 and so our experts have been documenting the the window frame area to understand how the window came out. And I want to note that we have found no window materials, the acrylic that the window panes are made of, we found really no acrylic inside the airplane. We've also removed the sidewall area in this row 14. We've removed the the, the sidewall, the plastic-like sidewall there to look behind there to see if we can understand what, what the denting to the fuselage looked like. And we've got a good look at the fuselage denting. We know what it looked like from outside the airplane. This allows us to get the perspective from inside to see how it was dented. The flight attendant interviews, they are being conducted today as we speak. Bill and his team are prepping the engine components, the fan blade components that we can send back to our materials lab in Washington, D.C. for a very detailed metallurgical examination. We'll have a maintenance group that will convene in Dallas at Southwest headquarters. Um, they will begin uh, to examine the inspection records for this engine and specifically for this fan section, these fan blades. 
understand the inspection history and what type of inspections were conducted. We are receiving good information. Passengers, as you know, there were 144 passengers on board this airplane, and we are receiving videos and still photos from those passengers. And we would like to encourage that if anybody would like to share their videos or their pictures of the inside of the airplane so we can better understand what was going on during this rapid depressurization, emergency descent, and landing. <coughs> we would love to get that, and that may be submitted through our email address, which is witness at NTSB. Dot gov. So again, witness at ntsb.gov. We are receiving information from that, and we appreciate the customers of Southwest Airlines for sending that material. Tomorrow, Bill and his team will be fi finalizing the, the on-scene portion of the investigation. This will be our last on-scene press briefing. Uh, this investigation is just really in its early stages. Just because we will not be doing any more on-scene press briefings doesn't mean, of course, the, that this is the end of the investigation. Uh, we've got a long way to go. But if you need, uh, we will be uh, periodically releasing information through our web page, www.ntsb.gov, or at Twitter, and our handle is at NTSB underscore newsroom. I do want to thank all of the parties involved in this investigation for their excellent cooperation. We're getting excellent cooperation from the parties, but also I, I, I want to note the, um, the cooperation we're getting from the airport, Philadelphia International Airport, um, great support. And, and finally, I want to thank American Airlines because we uh, they've allowed us to pull the airplane into the American Airlines hangar, and that's been a huge help, and it's meant that they've had to not have their airplanes in the hangar. So in just a moment, I'll call for questions, as we did yesterday. Uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand. When I recognize you, state your name and your outlet. So we'll begin right here. Yes, sir. Thank you, Kevin. John Rollins, Channel 6 here in Philadelphia. Uh, have you been able to clarify whether or not the engine involved in yesterday's mishap uh, was subject to the FAA airworthiness uh, directive that yeah, it's a great question. Have we been able to determine whether or not this engine, specifically these fan blades, were subject to an airworthiness directive that was issued um, a few years ago as a result of another event? And, and we have not been able to determine that, and it's not as easy as we think. Um, our, our power plant's engineer was explaining to me that a, a part number can change. If you have a fan blade that comes out as part number 123A, if that part gets a new update, that part number may be now 123B. And so that's the new part number because it's got the new modification. And so what we have to do is track the history of that blade to be able to determine whether or not that airworthiness directive actually um, did pertain uh, to this particular set of fan blades. And, and I know that people want answers right away, and, and we will do a very methodical inv investigation. Uh, our purpose for being here on scene is to document the perishable evidence, the information that can go, with, go away with the passage of time. We can track down that information next week when we go do the maintenance records review, but right now we just want to document everything that we can to... Um, um, so that once we leave, we either have what we need or we, ha we have a plan moving forward for getting what we need. The question right here. More on made with uh, NBC 10 here in Philadelphia. Uh, the other items that you're finding elsewhere, uh, can you tell us, first of all, you said you can sort of track where they might be. Are you tracking other ones? Are there other places you're going to be going to? And then also, once you find them, what happens then? How do they help you to... Yeah, great question. So it's uh, what are we doing? How are we tracking these parts that supposedly were being tracked on, on air traffic control radar? What are we doing with that? How are we finding them? That helps get us in the vicinity of where they might be. Those parts so far are just primarily more engine cowling parts. Um, and so they're fairly light parts, so they're going to be more 
uh, more aerodynamic and float more. Uh, we've not found any internal engine components uh, in, in, at this time. Um, so what we will do is that we will lay out those parts once we get them back, lay them out on the hangar floor to try and literally piece them back together to figure out what went where. So that's the long and the short of that. And are there other ones that you think you can find by, by this tracking? Yeah, are there others that we think we can find? And, and we are hopeful, um, but it may be that some of the very small components we may not find. But we can refine our searches. Um, our guys, I'm proud to work with them. They've been able to pinpoint uh, um, other parts that have come off of an airplane within the size of a football field that fell off at 37,000 feet. And they can say it's going to be in this area, and they can find it. So they do have the sophistication to do it, but we just don't, we don't know what we don't know at this point. We're still sort of in the very beginning stages of looking for what we need. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Chair, Chris O'Connell from Fox News here in Philadelphia. Uh, with regards to the pilot, you are someone who has had the hands on the controls of this aircraft. Can you tell us what kind of expertise, what kind of uh, training, and what she may have been going through trying to land a plane in the circumstances that you know it now? So what might this pilot have been going through? Certainly uh, we will get um, some good information when we interview him, which I indicated is going on right now. Um, yeah, I did fly a 737 for about 10 years, and, and I was an airline pilot for about 24. And so I can say that airline pilots are routinely trained on on rapid depressurizations, emergency descents, engine failure. You will not get in the simulator for a check ride without an engine failure and then coming around and doing a single engine landing. That is required in all training. So um, I will say that um, from what we heard yesterday, the pilots, uh, you could hear their intonation and uh, the pilots uh, seemed uh, very, uh, very calm and assured of what they were doing. And so I think without getting into, I haven't heard their interviews yet, but uh, as I said last night, my, my hat is, uh, is off to them. They behaved in a manner that, uh, that their training would prepare them for. So I'll go to you right here, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, can you first describe a little bit in more detail where the fan broke? I mean, was it at the root where the incident two years ago occurred? And then also, have your folks been able to determine whether the fatigue began from some surface uh, flaw or whether it was some interior? Uh, yeah. So Alan is asking a question about uh, have we determined where the fan blade separated and uh, was this as a result of a, a previous uh, manufacturing defect or something like that? I believe that's the long and the short of your question. So the fan blade, uh, it separated in two places. Uh, it separated at the, at, the, at the hub. So as I mentioned last night, we've got a hub and then 24 fan blades are going into this hub. So there's a fatigue fracture where this number 13 fan blade would come into, into that hub. So that we do have evidence of the fatigue fracture. It also fractured, let's say a fan blade is, um, let's say it's about that long. It also fractured roughly, roughly halfway through it. But it appears that the fatigue fra fr fracture was the initiating event which later caused that, that secondary uh, failure. And we have, um, we have the, um, let's see, do we have the, which part do we have? We have the root part. We have, we have the root part but we don't have that outboard part. Okay, thank you. So I hope, uh, and as far as was this a prior anomaly, uh, it's too early to tell, but that certainly will. The crack was interior, so if the fan blade would be shaped like, like this, going into the root, so here's the root, the fan blade's going around like that. It was on the interior part of the fan blade, so not more than likely, uh, well, certainly not detectable from, from looking at it from the outside. So, yes, sir. Uh, 
two things. Can you, how, can you describe, you said it was playing banks at a 31 degree angle. How long did, it, did that last? And what would that sensation be like on, on board? Uh, and, and then second, were you able to determine how old the engine was? Yeah, so a couple of questions here. Let's hit the engine. Do, do we know how old the engine was? Uh, we can get that information. We will get that information. We don't have it now. Again, that's not. We can get that information, Chris, next week. Um, and and then even still, the engine itself, it's not uncommon to, to, to trade out, to, 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 to put in new components. So we want to look at the entire history of this aircraft. As far as the bank angle, yes, it was uh, 41 or 42 degrees. 41.3 degrees. Um, it would be alarming because it was a rapid roll, and sometimes it's the rate of onset that that the body doesn't really like. It's a rapid roll, and it would be um, you would not normally detect. You would not normally have a roll rate that that uh, that fast or that bank angle in normal uh, airline operations. How long did that last? Uh, I, 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 a few seconds. The pilots were able to, and, and, and your natural reaction would be, if an airplane goes over like this, your natural reaction would be to grab the control wheel and straighten it out. So it did not last. It did not last long at all. Okay, sir, you, and then I'll come over over here. Similar. Are you concerned about the 737 fleet? Am I concerned about the 737 fleet? And. We are very concerned about this particular event. Um, engine failures like this uh, should not occur, obviously. And so, yes, we're, we're very concerned about this. David, to be able to extrapolate that to the entire 737 fleet, uh, I will say that if we find the need, uh, if we feel that this is a deeper issue, we have the capability to issue urgent safety recommendations. Well, we're not doing that tonight because we don't fully have all the facts surrounding this. But uh, I will say that the CFM 56 engine is a very widely used engine, and it's got a great, great record, uh, generally speaking. So um, let's see. We'll come to you, ma'am. Um, yes. Do you know the cause of death for the woman? Do we know the cause of death for the fatally injured uh, person? And no, we do not. The medical examiner would be the one who would determine that. They actually direct that to you. Well, we do not release that information. We don't. That's not our. That's not our bailiwick. We are. Accident investigators, we're not uh, experts in determining cause of death. Yes, sir. Mr. Sumwell, um, to pick up on David's question, how concerned are you right now that there may be a broader flaw in other engine fan uh, components across the world? How concerned am I personally, or is the NTSB, that there may be a broader flaw with uh, this particular um, engine? and? Uh, you know, we want to very carefully understand what res what was the result of this problem. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, I'm very concerned about this particular event. To be able to extrapolate that to the entire fleet, uh, I'm not willing to do that right now. We, we need to understand what happened here. Would you think flying 737 home? Would I have any problems? I'm, I'm driving to Washington. So, um, so we'll take one last question. Let's see. Somebody's... Could you describe what that pilot, what was the physical challenge for the pilots of landing that aircraft, given the drag, given the roll, given the open hole? Can you describe what they would have been going through? Can I describe what the pilots might have gone through? Um, the, the, I think they would be the best ones to determine that, and we're interviewing them right now. I'll take one last question okay. right here. Uh, to be clear, on the window, can you give any idea how it broke in or do we have any idea how the window broke? Um, we we, we uh, do not, and that's why we're examining the area around the window. So uh, that, that was the that was the last question right there. So so that was the last question. Look, I want to thank you all. Uh, we'll, we'll be available. I think it's up to Keith Holloway and, and Terry. Maybe we can do some one on ones. But that's the that's the end of the press conference. I want to thank you all for uh, for covering this, and uh, you can follow us on our Twitter handle. Thank you.